Good morning. Good morning. Is everybody good? Yes. Thank God it's not raining. Really <laughs> okay, if everybody will please stand and turn to 372. We're going to say we have that on way. Give us an idea of who's going to 
Uh, make what? Make sure we have plenty of food, but just come on out and we'll have a great time together doing that. Any other announcements that need to be made at this time? Yes, not. That's great. Uh, if you look on the back, you see prayer needs, and if you'd like to add or update, maybe take one off. Uh, now's the time to speak. Does anybody have a prayer need? Maybe a phrase or something you'd like to mention this morning? Uh, Carol? Praise um, my sister Sharon um, went and had tests for her aneurysm, heart aneurysm, and they said that it has not grown anymore. Okay. Um, so they're going to wait another six months for her to get tested again to see if they need to do surgery, but it hasn't grown anymore. So okay. That's good news. And that's, that is good news. Anita, have you raised your hand? Jason, how's your parents? They're a lot better. A lot better. Wonderful. That's great. Anybody else? Prayer need? Praise? Uh, Martha? A dear sweet friend of mine from college passed last week. I'd like her family remembered in prayer. Um, she was a wonderful teacher and she loved the Lord. She knew where she was going. And she is praising him today, I have no doubt. Amen. What was so, her name? The Terry Shriver family. Terry Shriver? Shriver. Anybody else? Why on the front here? Um, remember Steve Wellborn? He's uh, going to the doctor this week to find out about his kidney cancer, uh, hopefully set a date for his surgery in the near future. Uh, Brandy Music is recovered. She has foot surgery and uh, she's doing well. So I remember her. Uh, just trying to run down the list. Uh, Jean uh, Spears is at home. And, uh, of course, she's still, I think the main thing for her is to be strengthened in uh, what she's going through. So. If there is no other, yes, ma'am. Uh, unspoken. Unspoken. We all probably have one of those. All right. Our missions moment is from Children's Haven International. Uh, and they write, first and foremost, thanks for making 2022 such a wonderful year for the kiddos that found a home and a haven at CHI. Your gifts, especially many that came in right at the year's end, made last year truly one of our best in recent history. The only exception, of course, would be the tragic fire that took our gym on December 9th. But even then, we saw God's hand of protection, and we are now seeing his hand of provision in ways that are nothing short of miraculous. So please be on the lookout for a special mailing that they'll be sending out soon to bring everyone up to date on both what they refer to as Project SEAL and Project Fire Recovery. They have some uh, really exciting news to share. Now with uh, our support in 2022, they saw much growth at the home and many projects were completed. They remodeled the pool area, an additional waiting pool for the toddlers. Remodeling an old office, converting into a two-story structure that is now being used as temporary classrooms to classroom space to fill the gap for the three groups of children that were displaced due to the fire. I returned to in-person school for all students, PK through college, uh, after a year and a half of the COVID break. Uh, getting, of course, back into in-person classes, raised the enrollment of outside students, uh, back up to around 100. I also met our teaching staff for both multi-grade and regular classes, rose to 19 teachers and assistants. Advances in Project Steel, like the pouring of 11,200 square foot
concrete floor and insulation of pipes where, of course, bathrooms and steel support beams that allow us to soon affix the metal sheeting on three sides of this 108 by 110 building. I think it's bigger than the one that burned. Uh, and then a couple of other little things, but like I said, I'll put these up and you see, uh, of course, what they went through. It still costs a lot to build in Mexico or anywhere else, uh, but uh, continue to keep them in prayer as well as other missionaries. You can read the rest of this. I'll put it out there. It'll be there next Sunday along with others. Uh, oh, I just lost their name. Have uh, different ones that brought send in letters. I get probably about one or more a week. I encourage you, go out there and read them. Pray for them. Some of them have got a prayer list uh, maybe on the sheet front or back. Uh, some of them are one sheet, some of them are multi sheets. Uh, and uh, but be in prayer for your missionary. And with that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Our gracious Father, as we come before you, we thank you for our missionary, for all that they do all around this world. We only know a few and support a few. There are hundreds, thousands, I'm sure, Father, all around this world that are sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to experience life just like we do, just like Children's Haven International. Their, their gym burned down. Their multi-use building gym. But they're making do. And may what we collect today go and support them and be of great help. And there are others, Father, that we... Maybe they have a need. Maybe we learn of them. Maybe just to simply spend some time praying for them and their work. And of course, Lord, as I, as I pray, may you bless each missionary in our world with the work of leading someone to salvation in Jesus Christ. And Father, for this service, may we all come a little bit closer to salvation in Christ Jesus. Pray this in his name. Amen. Amen.
3, chapter 3, all of them, 1 through 26 this morning. The message is titled, Be Refreshed. And a little story about that song that the choir just sang, Sanctuary, at least the chorus part. When I first went into Bible college, I was 35. So if your child is not going to college yet and you're wondering what's going to happen, don't worry, God might call them later. But I was in, it was mostly older uh, people. I went in on the associate's program, had to be 35 or above, didn't have to go through all the paperwork. In our first class, I can't remember if it was old, I think it was church history was the class that we met in. And that was a song we'd sung almost every Sunday. Lord be a sanctuary tried and true. And you get a room full of men singing that. It sounds pretty good, even though half of us couldn't sing it in tune. But uh, that song just means a lot to me. Uh, hear it as sung again. Be a sanctuary. You know, and for a lot of us, they said the message is titled Be Refreshed. And we all need times of refreshing, right? And that song kind of, it would refresh us, start our day off right, and help us to be focused for what we were about to do uh, in college, you might say, that day. But sometimes we all need to be refreshed. Maybe you've been working hard and you need a bath or a shower to feel refreshed. Or it's been a while since you've eaten something and you, you need to eat in order to be refreshed. Or maybe there's a certain person that you just haven't seen and you long to see them and that would take and refresh you. And everybody we have these times where we need to be refreshed, be restored, encouraged, lifted up. And today as we look at this section of Acts chapter 3, you're going to see where Peter and John heal, refresh you might say, a man who hadn't walked since birth. Forty years, we learn in the next chapter, he was 40 years old and had never, ever walked. Upon seeing the amazement, Peter then kind of proclaims to everybody, look, it wasn't us. It was by the name of Jesus Christ that he was refreshed. And it's by the name of Jesus we can be refreshed. Not by my name, not by your name or your works, but by the name and works of Jesus Christ. And here we're going to see three requirements today for Jesus to refresh you. Shower might make you feel good. Some food might make you feel better. But if you want whatever you're facing in life to truly be refreshed, Jesus is the one who needs to take and do it. So if you have your Bibles open, hopefully you do by this point, I want to ask that you stand in reference to the reading of God's Word. I want to read verses 12 through 20 of Acts chapter 3. We're going to cover the whole chapter, but I'm just going to read 12 through 20. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power and piety we made it walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus, the one who you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, be put, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it was it is the name of Jesus, which has strengthened this man, who you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, brother, know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets that his Christ would suffer. He has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. Let's pray. Our Father, love, as we come before you this morning, we come 
to be refreshed. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our souls, Father. May we do that. Setting aside anything else, coming before you, refresh us, O oh Lord, by your word and by the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Three requirements for Jesus to refresh you. Number one, repentance. You must repent. Verses 1 through 10, Peter and John are going up to the temple. It's the ninth hour, which will be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's how the, the Jews told time, like 6 a.m. when the sun comes up. So the ninth hour would be like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Here's a man who's been lame from his mother's womb. He's never walked. He's carried, and they set him down every day at the gate of the temple. The temple complex had many gates, and they set him down by the gate called Beautiful. And he sits there, and he's begging for alms. <coughs> alms are essentially asking for a donation. You got alms for the poor, all helping, you got anything. It might be, in our currency, a penny or a $100 bill. It's kind of like CHI, we're asking for alms donations to send to them. Put it into the big jug out there. Well, he's laying there and that's what he's doing. He's asking for simple donations. So Peter and John are coming along. Now, what we notice, they're going for the hour of prayer. Jews had their hour of prayer. This is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Perhaps they did it at like 9, 12, 3, and probably again in the evening at 6. You might remember Daniel. He was known for every day at noontime, opening the windows facing Jerusalem, and he would have his time of prayer every day. Well, that's what you see Peter and John doing. They're keeping the Jewish tradition. They are now what we would refer to as Christians. They believe the Messiah has come, and that was Jesus. Not all Jews believe that yet, even though Pentecost has happened, and thousands of Jews believe, but they're still keeping the Jewish tradition. So they're going to the time of prayer. They see this man, and of course he's saying, all oh, dogs, you got anything you want that you can give me, please? Verse 4. Peter and John fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, we do not possess silver or gold, but what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Walk. Look at me. Look at me. That's what Peter and John were saying. Look at me. Fix your gaze on me. And of course, he's like, I'm going to get a $100 bill out of these guys. Peter gives him something else. He says, I don't have any money. I don't have any silver. I don't have any gold. What I have in the name of Jesus. He doesn't say get up and walk. He says, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. If you were that man, you were 40 years of age, and you've never walked, what would be your thought? They're crazy. I can't do it. What do you think? If you look at the next verse, 7, he's been told to get up and walk. In the name of Jesus, the Nazarene, verse 7, seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood up, and he began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. As John and Peter reached down and took him by the right hand, he could have started screaming, No! I can't walk! But he believed what they said. And he jumped up and he's praising God. Everybody saw him, what verse 9 says, and they're taking note of him. Isn't that the one that used to lay by the gate called Beautiful asking for alms? They're all amazed. 
in this scene. Now, requirement number one is repentance. How does he repent? Well, if you look over verse 16, it's basically saying the man had faith and repented. He believed. <clears throat> Repent or repentance basically means to change direction. You're walking and living life your way, and you realize it doesn't match God, and so you've got to make a U-turn, so to speak, and agree with God. In fact, anywhere you see the word repentance, you can take and make like a little U-turn, you know, with an arrow. You underline and come around. Put a little arrow in it to show. Repentance, change direction. That's what repentance means. The man had faith in what Peter and John told him in the name of Jesus the Nazarene and got up and walked. He didn't scream. He, he didn't yell. He didn't refuse. He did exactly what they said. Why? Because he had faith in them and if you want to repent of whatever's going on in your life, you're doing something that doesn't line up with God, you can repent. But you've got to have faith Hebrews 11, 1 said, here's the definition of faith. Faith is assurance of things you're hoping for. Conviction of things not seen. My hope is I'm going to walk into the golden streets of heaven one day. I've never seen it. I've never seen Jesus. But my faith is in him, and that's how I'll be able to walk in heaven. Can I get an amen? Did you agree? That's faith. I don't, I'm not assured that I'm going to go to heaven because of my works. Or I've been such a good little boy all my life. Why shouldn't I go there? Or I've given the missions or I've done A, B, or C. I'm only going in because my hope's in Christ who died for me. And I've confessed him as my Lord and my Savior. Have I been the perfect little boy since then? No. I'm messed up. But God forgives me. And you're going to see more of what God does for us too as we go through this passage. But I'm convicted. Though I've never seen Jesus, need to see him in heaven, I'm going to be there one day. And I hope you are too. Second requirement after repentance is reliance. Reliance. This takes us to the passage that I just read. It says, while he's clinging to Peter and John, now, I don't think he's clinging to him to hold him up. <laughs> he said, you got to kind of put yourself in his position. He's 40 years of age, never walked. How would you feel if somebody says, get up in the name of Jesus, pull you up, and you're walking, you're jumping, you're leaping. Wouldn't you be hugging on him too? I know I would. And I think that's what he's doing. It's not holding on to him to hold him up. It's Thank you, thank you, thank you. Type of praising God and for Peter and John introducing them to Jesus. Verse 12 says, when Peter saw the, the crowd, as verse 11 says, hey, this guy's walking. You know, he hadn't walked in 40 years and the crowd is forming. And so Peter replied to the people of Middle Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you take this with us as if by our own power of hiding? We made him walk. Peter said, it's not me. I didn't do this. Now he turns to say how it is the man walked. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. The one whom you delivered, disowned in the presence of Pilate, that he had decided to release him. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer, Barabbas, to be granted to you, and you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead. In fact, we're witnesses. Now, not everybody that's there at this time uh, would have remembered that, but a lot of them would have. What's my proof that they would have known about Jesus dying, resurrected, and so forth? Well, do you remember after Jesus' resurrection and he's on the road to Emmaus? And you got two guys that are walking along. Jesus kind of catches up to them. And he hears them talking. He says, what are you talking about? And their response is, where have you been? 
everybody in Jerusalem and their surrounding it knows about this man called Jesus. The Romans crucified him. He was buried, and now they say the tomb is empty. He's alive. You see, everybody knew. Well, I'm not sure how long of a period has passed since then for where we are, but people knew. Gossip spreads quicker than fire. And that's what took place. There's all kinds of rumors. The Jewish leaders are trying to say that his apostles stole the body. But the apostles are saying, we don't have it. If that had been the case, the Romans would have searched everybody's home and found that body and said, here he is, but they didn't. And so here, Peter and John say, we're witnesses. We saw him die on a cross. We saw him buried in a tomb. We saw him alive. He was, Jesus walked on this earth 40 days after his ascension, Sunday, I'll do Sunday to Sunday or when, says over 500 saw him one time. Of course, all the apostles saw him. His brother John, uh, James saw him. He's been, many a witness saw him alive after he died, crucified. And to be crucified, essentially, all the blood in your body is drained out. Your heart, fluid builds up around it where it can't be. That's crucifixion. It's the worst form of capital punishment John, Peter's like, look, we've seen him alive. We are witnesses. 16. It says, on the basis of faith, in Jesus' name, is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man, whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all. You see, it was by faith in Jesus the man was healed. So Peter's claiming. Wasn't faith in Peter and John. Wasn't faith in self. Faith in Jesus. He gave him perfect health is what Peter proclaims. Now, verse uh, 17. Brethren, talking to the crowd, you know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets that his Christ was going to suffer what he's fulfilled. You go back to the prophets, all the way back to Moses, through Malachi, in there you'll find where they declared bad things, we'll put it that way, were going to happen to the Messiah, the Christ. That he would be crucified. That his body, but his bones would not be broken. But that he would suffer punishment. It's in there. Well, he's fulfilled it all. Only Jesus the Nazarene fulfilled them all. Verse 19, therefore, I went too far. We'll stop at verse 18. Now. And so what we see here is in order to take and be saved, we must rely on the name of Jesus. Rely on Jesus. I don't care what you're facing in life. You've got to rely on Jesus. Now, mankind today wants to rely on money or their position or maybe somebody else or a false god. And a lot of us look, rely on self. Well, I can take care of this. Problem is, that doesn't work. It might work temporarily. You might be the smartest person in the world, the strongest person in the world, but none of that's going to get you into heaven. None of that's going to give you peace. You have to rely on God. Here's a verse for you, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, two verses. Maybe you know them. If you don't, you might want to look them up and learn them. Trust in the Lord with all, not some, all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. You see, we look at situations, we go, well, here's what I think we need to do. But God says, no, you got to do this. That doesn't make sense. Trust God. 
with all your very being, your heart, body, mind, soul, don't do what you think is right. In all your ways, not some again, all your ways, acknowledge God, and he'll straighten everything out. Well, I, you know, I've been dealing with health issues for years, and I think I got a new twist. Do you trust God? If you trust God, God will lead you to the right doctor, the right medicine, the right therapist, the right whatever. If you're on your own, you're on your own. You gotta trust God with everything. He's the great physician, not Doctor Whoever. You gotta trust Him, and He'll straighten everything up. Now, here's our human problem: I want it like, and it doesn't happen that way. But if you trust God with your life, and you're going to have some rocky moments. Probably the most peaceful moment of my life was closing the back of the U-Haul truck. All of our belongings were in that truck or in our vehicle. The house was for sale, not sold. As we drove to North Carolina, where I was entering Bible college. You see, as I closed the back of that door, I felt peace. I was right in the center of God's will. It didn't make sense. Wait a minute, you got a house you got to sell. Maybe you got to get rid of that. You can't afford to make those payments. Paula had the hope of a part time job. I didn't have one. Well, how am I going to pay rent, electric, put food on the table, pay for my. I didn't know. But I was right in the center of God's will, and I had that peace. I didn't know what tomorrow held. I just knew God, I was doing what God wanted me to do. He straightened out my pants. Everything worked out. Made it through. Paid for classes. Nobody went hungry. Life stayed on. It all worked out. Because I had to trust God. Now, I wish I could say I've trusted him every moment since then, but I failed because I'm human and we all will. That's why this is a verse to learn. Write it down. Carry it with you. You run to a hard time. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll straighten out your paths. Whatever you're going through. So, priority number one, repent, which takes faith. Priority number two, reliance on the name of Christ. Priority number three, rest. Rest. I know that's what everybody wants. Just don't fall asleep while I'm free. <laughs> now, verse 17 through 20. Now, brother, Peter says, you acted in ignorance concerning Jesus. That's what he's talking about. Ignorance means you didn't know better. Uh, just as your rulers did also. Remember Pilate? Pilate didn't want to see Jesus crucified. He wanted to release him. But the people who on Sunday were saying, Hosanna, was Jesus rode in and laid their branches and coats on the road, like treating him like a king. On Friday, he said, crucify him, crucify him. They acted in ignorance. They didn't know who he was. They trusted on their own understanding. Verse 18 says, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets, Christ would suffer. Had to be fulfilled. Yeah. He was scourged. You know what scourging is? It's not just taking a whip and whipping somebody. And you ever watch old westerns? Some of them had that uh, whip they might snap. Well, they take that whip, the Romans, and put bits of bone and metal in the end of that. So when they whip somebody, it would take and literally stick in the flesh. I hope your imagination is not great. So it's in there and they take it with them and do this. You get the idea? They almost scourged him to death. He suffered just as the scripture said he would. But look at verse 19. Woo! All right, because 
of that, repent, change directions, and return, return to God, so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Notice what it says about your sins. They're not covered over. They're gone. As far as the east is from the west, they're wiped away. What if I sin tomorrow? God, forgive me, I've sinned. First John 1 9. You confess, be forgiven. But you see, in the Old Testament, according to the sacrificial system, the high priest one day a week, one day a week, one day a year, would go into the Holy of Holies and meet God on top of the uh, um, Ark of the Covenant, sprinkle blood to cover over all the sins of Israel. Since Jesus paid our sin debt with his own blood, they're wiped away. They're not just covered over. They're gone. Whatever sin you've done in your life, remember Jesus says if you think it, it's a sin. Your life you'll have to commit. If you believe in Jesus, it's gone. It's wiped away. To believe, you have to have faith in him. Now think about that. Every sin you've ever committed, Lord God, I've sinned, would you forgive me? Does he give peace? Does that refresh you? Because it should. Whatever you've done in your life, and I can think back over my own life, hey, I, I, I messed up plenty. I am far from a perfect human being. I don't claim to be. God's forgiven. And when I stand before God, I'm ready to go into heaven, walk on those wonderful golden streets and see Peter and John and all these others. And I stand before Jesus. He's not going to say, oh, look at all these sins. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's no sin. Because God's wiped them all away. Now that should make you feel good. We see next, verse 20 says, and that he may send Jesus Christ appointed for you, because that's who refreshes us in the name of Jesus. 21, whom heaven, well, we skip down to 25 and 26. It is you who are the sons of the prophets, and the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, notice this, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. You see, when God called Abraham, it wasn't just to bless his blood genetic descendants. It's to bless everybody. Abraham was blessed because he believed in God. How do we get blessed? By believing in God. It's not a matter of, oh, I'm this really good person, or I've done a lot of good, or I put money in the offering plate, or I've donated to the CHI and this one and that one. Therefore, I'm, I'm okay. All right? I'm, this person's done more bad than I have. Certainly, God's going to let me that know. It's not the way it works. You're blessed if you believe. And if you believe, you've got to believe by faith. You can rest. Turmoil can be going on around this world, and it is, isn't it? But you can rest. Because I know who's in charge. Because I know if something happens to this old body, I know where it's going to end up. I have no doubt about that. That's my hope, my assurance. That's what we're supposed to be like. Now, I was baptized as a believer about the age of 12, almost 13. I just didn't fully rest in Christ until I was in my early 30s. Now, why is that? Well, uh, I grew up in a church. I didn't grow up in the church, but attending a church 
here to restore us, if I could claim some ignorance. I remember being in those first classes when I was in Bible college, and the, the professors really teaching from the Bible, and I'm going, I never knew that. Why didn't I hear that when I was in church? Why wasn't I taught that? And I'll confess right now, look, I went forward, pleased my parents, and because I had friends going at the same time, you know, safety in numbers. Pastor, did you believe in Jesus? Yeah. I did. I've been in Sunday school, vacation Bible school. The church had what was called training union. I went to it on Sunday night. Was I ever told, bow your head and pray, God, I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, come into my life and forgive me all my sins. No. I never prayed that. Was I saved? I believe I was. I went forward for the wrong reasons, but Jesus talked to me later and said, if you want a better life, which I'll tell you, if you want a better life, it's following Jesus. How's that begin? Faith. Repentance. Rely on him, and you can have rest. You can have all kinds of craziness going on in your life, but you can have rest in the Lord. Because that's what it is all about. Resting in him. Knowing that God may put you through something and give to get your attention may not like what you go through, but God's trying to say, look, you can rest in me. Stop trusting in yourself. We all have times we have to just simply stop, turn or return to God because we need his peace. We need refreshing. We need reviving and we have to trust God with the unknown. Let me go back to that man, that paralytic. Peter and John said, get up and walk in the name of Jesus. I had no idea what he thought. But he must have had just enough hope. Remember Jesus said this faith the size of mustard seed can move him out. He must have seen something when Peter and John said, look at me. He must have seen something in their eyes. He trusted them. He trusted the name of Jesus the Nazarene. And as they pulled him up, he wasn't fighting back. Forty years of age. Forty years of watching others walk. Can you imagine as a child seeing your neighbors looking out the window and here's all those kids playing kicking the ball, running around. And you can't do that. Get up and walk. I can. No. He trusted in the Lord. You want to be refreshed, revived? I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe you are having a great life right at this moment. And tomorrow's a new day. You want to be refreshed, revived? Of course, repent. Agree with God is required. If you don't agree with God, you're not repenting. You're telling God, you've got your way and I've got mine and I'm going to trust me. you got to trust God. you got to change direction. You, you may have to do it every single day, but you've got to repent and agree with him. Second is rely. Don't rely on me. Don't rely on your some actor or athlete or program. Rely on Jesus. Faith is what's required. You can't rely on him because, well, I've read all about him. You've got to rely on him by faith. The third, rest in God in Christ. Trust him totally, no matter what you are facing, knowing he provides the peace. You can't buy that peace. You can't barter for that peace. God says, here it is. Romans 8, 37 through 39. 
But in all these things do we need believers. Overwhelmingly conquered. We have victory through who? Jesus. Who loved us. Remember John 3, 16? For God so loved the world. Jesus came to die on a cross because he loved us. Through him who loved us, I'm convinced. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present now, or things to come, or powers, those in charge, or height or death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. So let's say it together. And say it as so you these are your words. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Know this. God loves you. Tomorrow could be the worst day of your life. God loves you. Tomorrow could be the best day of your life. No, God loves you. Nothing can separate you. If your faith is in Christ, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Loss of job, loss of life, loss of a loved one, loss of finances, God loves you. Well, why? Maybe God just wants your attention because you've drifted from Him. No, God loves you. Let's talk with God. Know that God hears whatever you might tell Him. Listen to Him, and then you are to go, be obedient, do what He says. So let's pray. Father above, we come before you this morning. We thank you for all that you do in our lives. We thank you that when we pray, you hear us. We thank you, Father, that you forgive our sins. And Lord, you know for every human being in this building who might watch online, you know exactly what they're going through. Do they need to repent? Are they relying on Jesus? Do they need that peaceful rest that only comes from Speak, O oh Lord, and may we hear you. Speak, O oh Lord, that we will all pay attention. Father, if there's one here that needs to accept Christ for the first time or rededicate their life to Christ, may they listen and do as you would have them to. Because they're seeking peace. I don't want anybody to be ignorant. I want them to learn what you can do. You don't just cover our sins. You wipe them away. They are as far as the east is from the west. And I thank you. I pray this by the blood of Christ and in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. As I pray, if you would like to come forward to the altar and just pray yourself, someone else. I hope you have at least one person. I made this request last year and I'm going to keep reminding you all. At least one person pray for their salvation. If you pray, I don't care how long it takes, years for their salvation. And pray until they're saved. Until they say Jesus is Lord and Savior. You've got sin in your life. God forgive them. If you, you believe in Christ, he doesn't just say, well, I'll cover it up. He says, it's gone. And by that knowledge, you have peace. Be refreshed. It doesn't make it perfect, and it won't make it perfect. But it will refresh you to know you're forgiven. You're in the eyes of God. So we're going to say, good hymn. 
son, not part, can pay for all your sins, whatever it is. Past, present, and future sins. Jesus paid it all. May you respond as he was trying to do. Please. Everybody, please stand. Page 213.